So, okay, so we're gonna call the meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council together. Um, it is 8.34 in the morning. We are recording this as far as we know. We're attempting to record it, and we have a quorum. Um, we're going to take our agenda slightly out of order today. Um, after general public comment, we're gonna go directly to action item 4A, which is speed limits and then on to the draft affordable housing priorities policy discussion, action for item 4B. Um, we'll do minutes after that, and then if we have time, we'll go back to the discussion item, 3A. Um, at 9.30ish, we will have a break in our meeting um, for, to welcome a official from the Tibetan national, I don't want to say government, but <laughs> from, from the, from t a representative of Tibet. Um, so we'll break at 9.30 for that. But until then, the first item of business is general public comment. This is on items other than the speed limits section of our agenda. Is there any public comment on anything but speed limits? Seeing none, we will move on, which brings us to item 4A. Um, we had a request um, for the council to adopt Mass General Law Chapter 90, Section 17C and 18B. It was referred to the Community Resources Committee and the Transportation Advisory Committee back in May. And so Community Resources is finally getting around to discussing it. And we have here the person who asked for it from, from the council, and we'll probably hear from him later, um, asked the council for it, John Griffin. But we also have some representatives of the town to help us through this discussion and hopefully answer some questions or be able to come back with answers later if we have questions that they can't answer today. And so I want to welcome up um, our town engineer, Jason, Jason Skeels, our chief of police, Scott Livingston, and Livingstone, is it Stone or Sin? Stone, sorry, Livingstone. <laughs> um, and, and you, and Gabriel Tenum, Ting, sorry, Ting, Gabriel Ting, captain in the Amherst Police Department. So all three of you can come up and sit here if you would like. I don't know if any of you have anything initial to say or if you're ready to just respond to any questions we might have. Yeah, so have, have a seat up here for questions. I know we probably have a few. Um, bring up a third chair, but yeah, I'm, I'm welcome for any comments if you've got initial comments. If not, we'll just get into questions. So, um, so this is, as I said, an initial discussion. So we don't have a lot of information about where this would affect or anything at this point, but there are two laws that we could adopt. Um, the first one is essentially what I can understand as a statutory reduction of speed to 25 miles per hour pretty much anywhere in town that is defined as sick, thickly settled. Um, um, that's the, uh, the provision that anywhere that's, anywhere that's defined as thickly settled and not yet posted. Okay. Um, there we go. There you go. That's on. So if it's already posted, you have to put the mic a little closer to If you, it's already posted, it does not okay. change that posted speed limit. Okay, so it's statutory for thickly settled in business areas that don't already have a speed limit sign on the street. Like the black and white uh, speed on. limit Can I signs. explain one more thing and then we'll get to questions? The second one is a adoption to reduce to 20 miles per hour um, speed limits in quote safety zones and I don't know one of the questions I'm going to have is what is a safety zone but but that we'll, we'll get to that but that that is the two things we're looking at a 25 mile and a 20 mile per hour I know Dorothy had a question right now um, it was to do with the phrasing uh, for example I've been hearing a lot from people in Amity about wanting to stop speeding and um, about five or six different people have come to me in the last month or two there is a sign that says 30 miles an hour, mm -hmm. although it is not obeyed. So when you said, unless it has been previously posted, I wasn't sure if that meant already previously posted at 25 miles per hour or posted as anything. The existing regulatory black and white posted signs are more or less set in stone. You can do a speed study um, mm -hmm. and go with the 85th percentile speed, of speed at which 85% of people are comfortable driving, and then they round that up to the nearest five miles an hour. 
um, and a lot of times that ends up raising this already posted speed limit. Um, so that's the Mass DOT, and Mass DOT needs to approve those regulatory speed limits. So, so then in, the, in that case, they would be requesting it be enforced, and there may some, have some structural changes to let drivers know that it's going to be enforced, maybe more signage, more the, the, um, the thing that posts the miles per hour. The uh, they had that, they got permission time. for it, and then it broke and it got taken away. Mm -hmm. I think it died. more enforcement or more traffic calming measures to, to, to get them back down. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the uh, Route 9 crosswalk. Use your mic, please. I'm thinking about the Route 9 area um, near Hampshire College, uh, which is 50 miles an hour. And then it hits just um, near Potline, a little bit before Potline, uh, what I would consider a thickly settled area. And I've been at transportation meetings where there have been neighborhood complaints about people endangered on that crosswalk or the lack of a crosswalk there. And then, but I, I'm trying to understand, is that section of the road belong to the state or does it, is it Amherst as well? The town owns it, but the state approved that the posted speed limits. And so those are already approved posted speed limits. And to so change that's what them, would require the speed study that 25 mile an hour townwide wouldn't apply there. No, no, I understand that, no, but I am particularly for that area because I've heard so many complaints mm -hmm. um, interested in figuring out, what, you know, or at least having time to think about what we might do because that's the fastest area in Amherst, at least the posted area. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. So given our first two questions, I think one of the things we might need to know in the future, and I'd, I'd like to know whether it's possible, is can we get a map or a list of, if we adopted this 25 mile thickly settled, where it would apply in town? Right, right. <laughs> we have a, a speed, um, a, you know, a speed zone map of the entire town, and it shows, you know, color-coded roads that already have posted speed limits and, you know, begins here, ends there. So we've got all that. I think I talked to IT yesterday, and they were going to make that uh, a version of that available on the GIS viewer. Oh. So we should have that up and running relatively quickly because we already had the coverage. You know, we we had the maps, but we didn't have it uh, available to the public yet. And would that indicate? I guess one of the questions I have is thickly settled. What what parts of our town? The way I read thickly settled was what houses, residentials that have less than, I don't know, what, what was the, 200, 200 feet, feet between them over a quarter mile. Do we have a lot of places in town that, yeah, that, comp that are, fit that? Yes, there are plenty of the neighborhoods in town that, that do fit that, um, that model. Um, but it, it does leave some other areas sort of open to interpretation. But I think most of the areas that that would be sort of open to interpretation under that 200 foot rule are already posted. So they're the more rural roads, they already have a posted speed limit. Um, they're the more main streets, you know, that, that already have a posted speed limit. Um, I think the one area where we get into the weeds are some of the neighborhoods that have fought pretty hard to get posted 30 mile an hour limit. We did the speed studies, we came out with 30 miles an hour is the appropriate speed for this neighborhood. And then all of a sudden, and that's like one street in a in a particular say in mm -hmm. a particular neighborhood. Um, all the other streets are unregulated, so they would be prima facie speeds. But then, if we drop all the neighboring streets to 25, I wonder what the people who fought so hard to get the 30 are going to want to. And and there's no good way out of it, unfortunately. Because there's no there's no easy the way. You have to go back to the state and have a traffic study done. Traffic study and the traffic study doesn't usually go lower unless you've done some things with the road, you know, engineering wise, if you do some, you know, curves, add curves or speed humps or, you know, narrow the road. There's certain, you know, there's engineering measures you can do to, to make a road slower, but they usually involve property take. You can't do them within the existing right of way that you have. So you usually have to either take property or finagle the road so that it, so that it's less comfortable to drive fast on. Steve or Andy, do you have questions? Yeah, so thickly settled also implies parking on the street. So I would think that that would be a big variable as to whether or not. Um, I, the rule just says that 
housing spaces at 200 feet, they're very, that's, that's really the only qualifier for thickly settled. Um, but I mean, parking on the street is another factor that yeah. can be considered in a speed study. That, that's kind of where I was going, that okay. the 85th yeah. percentile would change whether or not there's parking. People, yes. yeah. So I have a question for for the police. This is why I wanted you guys here too. You know, we can post signs all we want, right. um, but if they're not following it and we don't have the ability, I, you know, either funds or or officer manpower, to, if we don't enforce it, you, you've got a sign with no enforcement. So the question, one of the questions I have for you is, what is our speed enforcement? Do we have a policy of it? Is it something that if we reduced all streets in town that aren't posted from 30 to 25, I think is what this would do in those areas, is that something that our police force could enforce to bring the speeds down? Is that something that's practical? So good question, and um, these discussions happen continuously through the year. I probably get more emails from citizens about speeding on streets than any other. Um, and I'm glad you brought up Amity Street because if, of the three biggest complaints I get in town, it's, it's Amity Street, it's Southeast Street, and it's Bay Road, and we probably enforce on those streets more than any other. Now, that being said, uh, we don't have a traffic division, and it's something I'm trying to, to work out with, with staffing. Uh, officers who are on regular patrol and responding to calls are also responsible for conducting traffic enforcement in their downtime, and I, I say downtime when they're not responding to calls, making arrests, or you know, doing reports, or out community outreach, or any other tasks that they're assigned. So, um, quite honestly, we don't get enough time for officers to do traffic enforcement in town. We do have a number of grants that we participate in, state EOPS grants, where very specifically, or we um, do traffic enforcement, and that's where it probably happens most frequently is when we have these grants written for us. Um, but the simple answer to that is, you know, when we enforce on those streets, people slow down, and then when we leave, people speed up. So it's more cultural. Um, um, so there's no easy answer to that. Simple enforcement is just not the answer either. So. Pat and then Dorothy. Um, I was at a meeting of the Grantwood Mm -hmm. uh, area and I believe there was an officer Laramie who Laramie yes. Laramie and is he assigned to uh, traffic directly is he monitoring that or is that I mean I, I don't have those notes so I, I don't remember what he said about it but he was somehow or other connected to the Grantwood area as a right. traffic so no officer Laramie is our community outreach officer so he wouldn't specifically be uh, designated as an officer that would do yeah. traffic, but he would, uh, you know, typically what would happen is he will bring the, these concerns to the to Captain Ting, who's our operational captain, and then we have a big board um, in the roll call room downstairs where officers have assignments to, okay, we've received a number of complaints from, you know, so-and-so street, we need to do enforcement, and sometimes it's very specific, like people are speeding going to work from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., so officers will go down there from those times. But again, you know, people are very good about going to speed limit when a police officer's there and not so much in general life. So, I mean, it's... Right. I mean, yeah, it's, it's certainly what everybody knows that, you know, if you stay under 10 miles an hour with the speed limit, you're going to be okay. Dorothy. Oh. <laughs> Dorothy. So, so the question on Amity Street, uh, there are two, there are three aspects, crosswalks, speeding cars, safety, and trucks. So, and I'm getting a lot of communication. So th what, uh, I'll deal with trucks first, and that, this has been raised here, and I believe in this committee previously, but the constituents are raising it with me now, that uh, why are big trucks, through traffic trucks, um, going on Amity Street and not on Route 9? Um, because there's, it's really, Amity is a residential street. It's the big trash collector trucks are bad enough. So I am really glad that my husband takes it straight to the dump, that we don't have that coming by. Those are monster trucks coming into a residential neighborhood, which is weird enough. But when trucks are just going through, they should not really be on that street. They should be rooted, I believe, or at least the, we, we people in my neighborhood believe, 
on Route 9. That's number one. But number two, after a lot of discussion, a lot of people talking about this, a lot of, truthfully, it's, it's women up and down the street, um, mothers and grandmothers that are getting, they're talking to each other and they're getting very upset. They're thinking that maybe what we really need at that intersection of Lincoln and Amity, they want to crosswalk further down the road. We did get the crosswalk at Lincoln and Amity repainted, thank you very much, and people are feeling very happy about that. But they think maybe we have to have a traffic light because um, there are, like every six months, and you have the facts, there's an accident because it's just a very difficult turn for people and to cross it, and I do it all the time, and I, I am just, I do very old-fashioned conservative driving, which is I wait, 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 wait until there's nobody coming, and then I move rather quickly because you can't see the visibility coming down from um, uh, East Pleasant Street, North Pleasant Street isn't too good. Is there any possibility of one rooting heavy through trucks on Route 9, State Road, not on residential Amity Street? And two, have you looked at or are you willing to consider a traffic light uh, at the corner of Lincoln and Amity? So for the first question about rerouting um, large vehicles, trans, you know, trucks, that sort of thing, um, I don't think that will happen. Um, they're lawfully allowed to, you know, there are certain mechanisms in place where the town could take action on a, on a roadway. Um, actually in Northampton, if you travel there, there are very, there are several streets along the Route 9 corridor where they restrict trucks who are going to the Coca-Cola plant. You can see those signs very specifically saying no large trucks, I think it's a $300 fine. So there are town bylaws that can be put in place to restrict that. Um, but as far as traffic lights, that's Jason's expertise. Um, we have looked at that intersection for a couple different possible treatments of, of intersection control. Um, we've looked at a roundabout option. We've looked at, um, I don't think we we haven't fully looked at a signalized option because I think the roundabout would actually work better and calm traffic more than just a, 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 a straight up traffic signal. So um, we are looking at it. We're only in the preliminary stages and there's zero funding for it. So follow up on that very um, quick. A quick follow up, but I want us to really try and keep our conversation to speed limits today because that's what we're talking about. We'll get back to general transportation at some other meeting, but yeah. Um, I had heard about the roundabout and most of us thought that that couldn't be true. So it's the woman who told me about it said, no, no, I, they really were considering it. Wouldn't you have to take private property um, to get enough room for a roundabout there? No, you can fit a mini roundabout in there without taking, you, there's probably okay. a little bit of a taking, um, just a couple of corners, but not any major taking. You can okay. fit a mini roundabout in there, which would slightly deter truck traffic, poss potentially. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, you can fit it, and we're still playing with it, so okay. we're really still in the conceptual phase of looking at it. But, um, oh, and one, just one thing to add about truck exclusions, um, those also have to be approved by Mass DOT. Okay. Okay. Um, I think Steve and then Andy. Yeah, so you, you uh, so it's all Amity all the time, but one thing that's always struck me about Amity is the passing, that, that there's a double, there's a dash line which means you can pass either direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I was always curious as to, obviously there was a safety check on that. At some point, yes, um, as far back in history, I'm sure. I know um, about 20 years ago, we were able to reduce the speed limit on Amity from, I think it was 35 to 30. Um, we narrowed the lanes, increased the bike lanes, made the bike lanes wider, narrowed the travel lanes, I think to 11 feet. I'm not, this is a little bit before my time, but but then at that time we did the speed, we narrowed the lanes, did the speed study, and it actually did accomplish reducing the the 85th percentile speed from 35 to 30 at least. Okay. But um, that's, again, sometimes those, those remedies last a while and then fade as vehicles get faster. Andy. Uh, from my uh, years in the select board, I guess the, some of these things are not new because they're issues that I dealt with in my prior capacity. Um, one thing, I have a couple things, to, there are three things to ask about. One is uh, to what extent does the um, experience with uh, 
accidents in an area affect decisions about posted speed limits or enforcement policies? So that's one of the factors they look at in a speed study is you look at the 85th percentile isn't the only ruling um, uh, number that you look at when you're considering speed. You do look at the last, I think it's five years worth of accidents to see if any of them are, are heavily related to speed. Um, a lot of times you don't get that much from that though. That doesn't boost it enough where you can say, oh, we really need to reduce this by 10 more miles an hour because the, the accidents are, it's hard to say when they're, when they're truly speed related accidents because um, a lot of the accidents aren't. They're, you know, minor fender benders aren't necessarily speed related. So it's, it's hard to quantify if it's a, a definite speed related accident unless, you know, it's a curve with a whole lot of rollovers, then you can say, okay, they were going too fast. But a lot, especially residential streets, the accidents aren't gonna be that drastic. Yeah. Do you have a follow up? Yeah, because um, there are also accidents that uh, occur when people are going too fast and they don't stay within the road, they go off onto someone's lawn. Um, I'm trying not to look at a member of the audience who's raised this issue with me previously um, in my select board days. But, um, the, you know, that, that's, is that considered in a different way? And then when you get into those kinds of investigations, either from your side as traffic engineering or the police side, how do you make the determination whether the speed limit might be the, the problem or enforcement might be the problem or the road layout might be the problem? Yeah. They all, you have to look at them all. You have to look at every, every part of that. And they're all you know, individual parts of a bigger puzzle. So it's, it's really, you have to take all the information and have it in front of you and, and figure out the best means of a cure. And you know, if it's already posted at 30 and someone goes off the road at 50 miles an hour, then what are the signs really doing for you in the first place? You know, it's, it's they're, 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 the reason they take that 85th percentile to set speed limits is because there is a 15% of people that feel comfortable going 20 miles an hour over the speed limit or whatever. And that, that's when those are the people you, you can't always control. You know, there's, there's a certain percent of the population that aren't gonna follow the rules. Um, not just yeah. true in speed enforcement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pat. Just a, just oh, a comment. Yep. Are you done? Are you done? Yeah. Mr. Feinberg, is that um, you know, in any in any crash investigation, you know, certainly the police officer will take every single factor into consideration. And what we found a lot of times is is speed isn't necessarily the factor. A lot of times it's inattention. There might be some other factors, certainly in this community, alcohol can be a factor as well. Um, so it, it's kind of a case by case basis. And we haven't, you know, obviously if there's a specific uh, area that, that we're consistently seeing with car crashes or, or incidents or whatnot, and that's something that we'll certainly apply a little bit more enforcement and attention to, to try and figure out exactly what the cause is. Okay. You can keep going. Yeah. I do have one other thing I'm gonna to switch to in a second that um, the area that I was referencing in, uh, a moment ago was Southeast Street. And there's lots of problems on Southeast Street because there's uh, the speed in some sections that is appro more probably more appropriate. It goes through thickly settled areas. It goes around curves. It goes into narrow bridges. That's a particularly difficult street um, to establish a normal policy to, but yet it's an important street because it is carrying a lot of traffic and uh, has had some unfortunate, very, uh, you know, incidents that have occurred. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask about, though, is that this started because there was an um, unfortunate accident that led to a, um, de a death on uh, North Pleasant Street. And um, what was the speed limit posted? I can't 
can't remember what the speed and was the speeding a factor in that? Uh, if we're talking about the individual, the UMass student who, who was struck last year, um, yes, speed was not a factor. Um, there was no impairment. It was an accident. Um, was lighting in that area a factor? I know that Officer Laramie and um, some of the um, other officers involved in that patrol district have done a, a study on making recommendations to that neighborhood specific about lighting was one of the things they talked about. Sidewalks was another. But the speed zone, I think, is 35 through there, uh, which is appropriate. It's another area that gets a lot of enforcement, radar enforcement in that neck of the woods. There's a lot of pedestrians there. So it's an area we concentrate a lot on. And we have access. Uh, use your mic, please. I'm sorry. We have access to that report. It's uh, an informal report that he's done so far. It has, I think it's made its way to the town manager's office, but um, I don't think it's reached to the, where it's gotten to the public uh, publication. Okay, Dorothy. Um, I think that she's talking about something that's very important. Uh, I s spoke at a meeting recently that I felt it was very dangerous and unpleasant driving in Amherst at night because it is a pedestrian city and there's crosswalks and we can't see the people. And those two things that could help, one would be more lighting at crosswalks. But the other one is I think we need a big campaign. Um, I, I saw a man in a wheelchair by the side of the road at dusk wearing all black. And I thought, oh my God, my God, I could have hit him. Um, it's very scary for all of us. So I think we need more lighting at, at the crosswalks and we need a campaign um, of, of uh, fluorescent stripes or at least wear something light or something white because people are walking around here just completely dressed in black at dark crosswalks and it's it's very unsafe. Agreed. Can we do a campaign? Um, we've done actually um, campaigns. We've done Amherst Police handouts of fluorescent vests. It was more targeting kids and joggers and that was probably six, seven years ago. It's actually ongoing, you know, anytime we have any type of fairs where, um, where we encounter large numbers of, of the public, we actually hand out um, these Velcro uh, wristbands that are reflective to try and encourage that, to try and encourage people to wear something on their, on their person that, that is reflective for that reason. Exactly. Steve. So <laughs> I know we're going way off of speed limits, but so in the downtown area where there are crosswalks, we know that cars have to stop if you're in the crosswalk, but can you, is there such a thing as jaywalking in Amherst? There is not, and we um, broached that subject at least 15 years ago where we were, it became a comedy show um, where we would have officers in uniform blowing whistle pe at people who were jaywalking and it didn't go over well. <laughs> So I, I'm going to try and bring us back to speed limits. I'm going to take my, I, I have some questions. Um, you know, there's, there's two things here. There's the, the statutory 25, and we've, we're, we're need more information, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get that more information to even see where it might apply. Um, but one of the things I think we would need to consider is our accident history, our dangerous inter intersections, accidents, complaints, um, whether, what, so one of my questions is what intersections or roads have the most traffic accidents? Uh, are they speed related or where are the ones that are speed related? And are those roads already posted or are they statutory where this, this adoption of this would actually lower the speed limit? And I don't know whether you can answer that now, but. <laughs> I mean, I can tr give you some ideas of things that we've tried to work with with the DPW because I get requests frequently from uh, Mr. Mooring about, hey, can you give us the five-year history on traffic accidents at you know, position A, B, or C, and we do that frequently. Uh, here's an example. I mean, the Route 116 bypass at Meadow Street. Now, we get a lot of accidents there, and speed is usually a factor, or the red, running red lights. When, we, when Guilford requested information on that, as far as accidents were concerned, to get some redesigns of that intersection, we all thought it would be a slam dunk. Yep, the state's gonna see the criteria here, how often we respond to accidents, they're going to have to act. And it just didn't meet the criteria of the state to have that intersection changed, which 
kind of baffled us all, but whatever criteria they look at. A little bit there. They, yeah. added, the, they added turn lane. Instead of having a double through lane, they turned one of those through lanes into a turn, a left turn only lane. So they did that. It was kind of a, a minor modification. Um, I don't know if there's any proven results because that one, that particular intersection comes up. Um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission mm -hmm. does valley-wide, uh, you know, top top 100 uh, most dangerous intersections, and that mm -hmm. one came up on it. And since it was a state highway intersection, it's not controlled by the town. Okay. Um, they did they did those minor modifications. I don't know if there's any. I haven't seen any follow-up uh, data to see if it helped or decreased the accidents there yet or not. Yeah, I mean, when um, the redesign for East Pleasant and Triangle came in, that was another area. So the, the roundabout has helped um, with the reduction in accidents there. But that was one where we assisted the DPW in um, accident information about what, what we could do with that intersection. And are there any other intersections in town that this that aren't necessarily posted that are thickly settled that you can sort of immediately recall and come up with your head saying, oh, that would be a good one that this might apply to. Um, Amity and you drive, and I know that's in the works. Uh, Gabe, anything yeah, else? Nothing, um, but that's already posted. posted speed speed Northampton limits, so. and Snell Street, we have a lot of a lot of crashes in that, that specific um, intersection, but it is posted. Right. Um, Andy and then Pat. Well, I'm glad that uh, Chief uh, brought up the traffic circle because it reminds me of something going back again to select board experiences that was installed during my days in the select board. Uh, we need to always be careful as part-time elected officials to think that we know the solutions because there was a lot of um, angst in town meeting about that not being the correct solution. And uh, we, in the end, on the select board, were left with the decision and uh, decided that the best approach was to go with the professionals because we don't have the expertise. We didn't think that town meeting members had the expertise. And uh, I think that it's something that uh, learned from that experience that the traffic circle was the right thing to do and or the roundabout to use the correct term i guess um, and i think that when we get to the speed limit question you know it's going to make me very cautious about not jumping ahead of where all of you who have the professional expertise in enforcement uh, investigation of incidents and traffic engineering are there um, and uh, as far as, and I'm, I want to, at some point, um, Ms. Pam, we do need to come to some discussion about lighting, but that is a long discussion to have because there's a whole history of how decisions on lighting were made and the pros and cons of adding lighting. Um, and that's, um, that's now within the decision making of the council. It used to be in the select board, uh, but knowing the complexity of it, I think that we need to get the complexity learned here, but that's not a speed issue. Pat? Yeah, I'm thinking directly right now about Stanley Street um, because I've, uh, we're working on seeing whether we can have the DPW there, blah, blah, blah. So I've been meeting with residents there quite a bit um, and there is always ongoing concern, even now with the Station Road Bridge and that people are speeding through there. Is that an area you've gotten information about? And if it isn't, how, what should I tell residents to do about contacting you? Should they? So yes, um, Stanley Street is not one that I'm, I've been receiving a lot of complaints about, Gabe. I don't know if you've heard much. But um, you know there is an area on our website, on the Amherst Police Department website, where you can request enforcement and or our speed radar. Um, we move that around from town to town. Again, those are temporary fixes, um, but. You can continue and then Dorothy. I, what do you see as some of the fixes? Um, 
what impact would having 25 miles an hour everywhere in Amherst um, have, really? Uh, what, uh, what negative and what positive impact could it have? Forgetting how we get there or, or whatever. What do you see as the major issues? I, I know we have a woman here who lives on Southeast Street who, and talks about neighbors really being afraid to even get their mail. We have a gentleman who is a friend of a, uh, a man who was killed on North Pleasant Street, and there was fatality before on that street. What, what would you do if you could do anything? Um, I think, I mean, some, some of these are just accidents, and they happen. Um, the, the, the issue of the 25 mile an hour posted speed limit won't solve any of those. Um, because those roads are already posted with a set speed limit. Um, and reducing them would be difficult unless you um, engineered some traffic calming into the streets that, that you know, you have to have drastic curbs, narrow mm -hmm. lanes, speed humps. Um, speed humps aren't that popular with first responders. Right. Um, ambulances and fire trucks, you can't really put them on main thoroughfares because they can damage equipment. So you have to come up with the sort of the horizontal treatments that make a road, you have to make the road less comfortable to drive fast on. So that means taking out the straight of ways. And if there's already houses on both sides, there's not a whole lot of, of, of room yeah, to no, do that. that. Mm -hmm. um, I so mean, that, that's one of the possibilities, but really that's the only way to change an already set speed limit. The, the 25 mile an hours are only gonna change them in the unposted, you know, outskirt neighborhoods. And I don't know how much effect yeah. that'll have. I'm, I'm glad Jason said it first because if I said it, Guilford would have been calling me up immediately. But some of these roadways, Southeast Street and uh, Potwine Lane in particular, where we get a lot of complaints because of the soccer fields and stuff. But some of these streets that were designed back in the 30s and 40s were just not designed for the type of traffic they're receiving now, um, the vehicles that are using them. And it really comes down to a cultural change. People are. They're just speeding more. Yeah. Um, just from personal experience, real quickly, um, whenever we do traffic ramps, I like to sign up for those. And one of the hot spots that I always hit is um, Bridge Street in North Amherst because that's post well posted, 25 miles per hour. Bridge Street. Bridge, Bridge Street. Street. Yeah. And it, it's constant. I mean, people speed through there and you just totally disregard it. And that's really well posted, 25. In, I think in three spots in a very yeah. you know, about a quarter of a mile section. So I, I I always hit that spot because it's easy pickings for me. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, what that tells me is that every single time I go there, I can catch speeders nonstop. So that tells mm -hmm. me that they're really not abiding by it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unfortunately. Um, uh, Steve, were you? Did you have something, or, or should I move to Dorothy? Because I know Dorothy did. Um, I totally forgot what okay, so Dorothy. <laughs> um, two quick things. Uh, one of the crosswalks that bothers me as a driver yeah, are the ones that the, um, on University in UMass. I find them dark. I, I, I don't see them coming closely enough. Um, you know, Amherst College has those little flashing lights. Um, couldn't UMass have that up for those ones? Because I know that people speed. When I see a police car on the side of the road, I, I slow down. It reminds me, yes, got to slow down, because in our minds, it's a through road, but it's not a through road. It's got crosswalks, it's got students. And um, I, I really don't want to hit anybody. I, it's, it's one of my big mantras, do not want to hit anybody. So I'd like to have it uh, safer Except for... <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, it, we do think about that a lot. And the, and the other one is, because I think it's good to um, keep rumors down and to have some idea what people, what's really going to happen, the roundabout at University and Amity, which I think must be in the works. I'd like to hear some more about that when it's appropriate. We'll hear about that later. Um, so we're gonna hear from Steve. I have one additional question and then we're gonna open it up to public comment because I promised co public comment and sure. then we might open it up, to, hold on. And, um, and then we will um, potentially bring you guys back for if we have time for another day? Uh, well, potentially another day, but oh. today it's going to be, we're going to do Steve, we're going to do me, we're going to do public comment, and then we'll see if the counselors sure. have a little more questions before we take a break. 
Dave was ready to talk. No, I just want to make sure that we have our staff here while yeah. the public, yes. just so they can hear. Yes. A little interview. Yes. Um, so, so that that's why I said after the public comment, we'll come back with you guys sitting there for potential counselors and 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 answers and stuff. Okay. So, Steve. So I remember my question. So I live in a thickly settled area, and every once in a while, my neighbors will tell me to, you know, they'll go slow down or whatever. Mm. <laughs> yeah, my. <laughs> I drive a standard, and so in my neighborhood, I keep it in a lower gear, yeah. keep myself honest, yeah. and uh, but same, same sometimes it makes the engine a little louder, you know, and I get, the people won't even look, people are not even looking in my direction, but they hear it, and I get the yeah, yeah. thing, and I'm like, that's, I'm doing 30, I don't, so I think there is some, there, there is something to be said about people's perceptions of speed versus the actual, because a lot of times when we go in and do these speed studies, we find that People aren't really speeding that much. It's it's just people perceive the vehicles to be moving faster than they really are. And you know, mm -hmm. when we do the speed studies, our equipment is pretty stealthy, so I don't think that's skewing any results. But mm -hmm. but I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I think there there's there oftentimes is a is a big separation between the perception of lots of speeders versus the actual you know. Yeah. We use the word in criminal and law enforcement and in courts and stuff. What is reasonable, reasonableness, yeah. and um, it's very different to very yeah. different people. So I have one question that I I don't know whether you can answer today, but I want you to if we can get an answer. The 20 mile per hour statutory one that were also was referred to us. What is a safety zone? Is it something that we as a council get to just? Define or it is. it is. I wasn't able to find much information on that. I didn't. I didn't look at that too as much as I looked at the 25. But I think it is. I think you can call it. You can. You can dub a corridor that maybe ha includes a, a school, zone. A, a library, a senior center, yeah. or factors like that where you can call this suddenly a safety zone. Or maybe it's just an area that has high pedestrian use, like. I, you could probably do UMass campus. You could do Amherst College campus, that sort of thing, and probably call those a safety zone. But I do need, I do want to do a little more research and look up what, if there are any, they, they're very, it was very, they leave it very wide open, it seems okay. like. Um, so yeah, I think it's kind of, you define it, they approve it, and then you can go with that. So some more information for us to help us yeah. tackle that potential I think at some point or or even if we do get zone. to define it where our town officials might suggest it be right. defined too so that you know as Andy said we're not experts so a Andy and then we're going to take public comment yeah, it was just to point out that the 20 mile an hour needs permission from the state uh, division of highways we don't get to make the final decision on a 20 mile so we're going to thank you all. Please stay for the public comments, and we'll sure. bring you back up in case we have more council comments today. Um, this is the first of probably a few conversations about this. Um, and then in the audience, are there individuals who would, make, would like to make public comments, questions? I see two. We're going to recognize the original petitioner first, John Griffin. So come on up. Make sure the mic is on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I guess I, I, the, the first thing that I wanted to address uh, as I was listening to uh, the question and answer, and, and I appreciate all the feedback that, that you gave, um, there have been a number of uh, newspaper articles uh, since Mass General Law 17C was passed, uh, particularly from the Boston Globe, about how Boston and Cambridge are using these state laws to change their speed limits in residential zones citywide. And from experience, driving in those cities they are changing posted speed limits as well. So I'm curious where there's uh, either a difference of interpretation or where they're finding the power to 
take this action citywide, including changing posted speed limit signs, and we're feeling a little bit more hesitant about that. Um, for me, I find that this is a huge quality of life issue. I moved here 15 years ago from Oregon, um, and speed limits in the city where I grew up, even though I, we are relatively a both denser city in Eugene, as well as a relatively much more uh, rural region out west. Mm -hmm. And speed limits in Eugene are drastically lower. There's 20 and 25 miles an hour basically citywide. And I've found it incredibly frustrating uh, how difficult it is to lower the speed limits in Massachusetts and this extensive uh, speed survey process that has to be followed. And until MGL 17C was passed, there was basically no effective way that I could see in this state to actually lower a speed limit. Because as the town engineer said, when you do a speed, speed survey, as they did in Hadley, you'll frequently encounter that the survey says, yeah, you should raise the speed limit. There was a neighborhood in Hadley where they were trying to get the 35 reduced to a 30, and instead they had to raise it to a 45, 10 miles an hour higher because of the speed survey. That just seems totally crazy. I, I just had a job interview at, at Oregon State University. I was thinking about moving back home and negotiations didn't work out, but one of the things when I was out there for the interview that struck me being in Corvallis was how incredibly comfortable it was walking on sidewalks amongst 20 and 25 mile an hour zones. And these were consistently both enforced. I saw police pulling people over as well as respected. I, you know, I had to drive around, I had a rental car when I was there and driving on a posted 25 mile an hour street meant usually 20 to 23 miles an hour. And if I was going much faster than that, I was pulling away from traffic around me. It was a cultural difference. It's, uh, I, I recognize that uh, posting speed limit signs also has to be accompanied by enforcement. And I have to say, I, I disagree with some of what was said around enforcement, especially on North Pleasant Street. I've been driving that street for the last 15 years. And I've once or twice seen a morning speed patrol. Other than that, never. I see people going 40, 50 miles an hour down that street. And I also disagree with the contention that 35 miles an hour is safe for that street. You have a very narrow shoulder where people try to use as a bicycle lane. You have buses, you have a number of crosswalks. I think 25 is the maximum for that street. And in the case of a accident where a pedestrian was struck in a crosswalk, if that person had been respecting a 25 mile an hour speed limit versus 35 mile an hour speed limit, there's a significant statistical chance that that person would have survived. Thank you. Um, it, Ms. McGowan. So um, I've been in front, of, in front of this microphone before on this issue. Um, 25 miles an hour increases accident survivability. It makes it safer for people walking, bikers, people in their front yards. Um, people have houses next to roads. That's the purpose of a road. Getting mail, pulling your car out of a driveway. Um, Obviously, lowering the speed limit to 25 mi mil miles per hour will get people out of their cars and get kids on bikes and people on bicycles and walking more. And so that would be part of our sustainability push. But also, just it'd be nice to have people not so injured. Um, there's a state um, report that says there's three keys to um, safety, which is education and to educate the public, which is that animals, people, and bikers have the right of way, and cars must slow or stop and only go around them when it's safe. I don't think anyone, or like I think 12 people know this in Amherst. Um, this, and so educating what the law is, that you know, actually a cow has more of a right of way than a walker. Um, the second thing is enforcement, and I, you know, I know the police department is trying, and there's really no dedicated officer, it'd be a great money maker. So education enforcement are the cheapest and best ways to get people to slow down. The third way is engineering, which is traffic calming, which is expensive. Um, you know, it's all these different kind of things. And, you know, we've done some tweaks, and I think it's had an effect, but it could go on for years and cost millions of dollars. Why not educate the public and enforce it, the law? And then also, if we went to 25 miles an hour, just safer for everyone. Um, I live on the Southeast Street Speedway as um, an elderly member of my community, my neighbor has said, Southeast Street has had none of these solutions. There's been um, 
there's not an education campaign. It's very spotty enforcement for the reasons the chiefs gave. There's been, the only engineering is that we had two signs put up saying 25 miles an hour, which is actually higher than the recommended speed limit of the third traffic study that we had that did show speeding. We've had no other traffic calming happen. Um, so we have no lower speed limit. We have no enforcement, very spotty enforcement. We have very, almost no traffic calming measures. And we have a continued series of accidents that I've sort of stopped sending to people. I used to send it pictures to the select board every year, two grandmothers with kids in their car just hit at the top of um, the hill near my house a few months ago and just another day. Um, so I think lowering the speed limit to 25 mi miles an hour would be the cultural change and it would be town-wide. Um, if, you know, on my street, people, you know, they go 60, 50 miles an hour. On Northeast Street, you can go up to 50 miles an hour and dropping to 25 as you get into that Cushman Corner area, you know, people are already moving, but if you were at 25, and you're going into more thickly air settled area, you're still at 25. Or maybe you're going 30, Pat, but then you'll drop down. To, and, and 30 is the number where people survive more. And so why wouldn't you do that? It's, you know, people will, the people will drive less, people will walk more, they'll feel safer, um, people will bike more, you know, we'll, you, we'll all feel safe on the roads. And, you know, I know I have to live on a road with a lot of rush hour traffic, and, I, you know, that's just the way it goes. But if it was going 25 miles an hour or 30 miles an hour, that'd be a gift to the people on my street. And nothing has been done in years. These people have been complained about it for a long time. And we could be a great experiment in showing that. We have most, you know, we have a huge amount of students. We have a lot of older drivers. I love the darkness of Amherst, but it is sort of terrifying. When I go down Southeast Street at night, I go really slowly because I'm waiting for that person in black clothes to step out. If we were all going really slowly, we'd have a better community to live in and be safer. And I just would love to see this happen. Thank you. Does, before we close this up for today, do the counselors have any additional questions or requests for information from our town staff at this point? Dorothy. The question on the Amity University uh, proposed roundabout. I, uh, hold on, I, I will add those two questions and requests for information to a discussion that we'll have about traffic and public safety in general at a future CRC meeting. Okay, um, Dave. Yeah, the one thing I wanted to add was, um, I hope I didn't overwhelm folks with the number of links I sent. Were they, were you able to follow the links or not? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. So one thing I would put on our agenda for, for a future meeting would be, what are some of the experiences of other communities throughout Massachusetts that have already done this? Um, we're, we're not breaking any new ground here, in my opinion. Uh, lots of other communities, as the previous speaker indicated, um, you know, Boston, Worcester, and some, some communities out west here have done this. So I think it'd be interesting to talk to some of those communities and, and just get the feedback and, and see from their police departments, from their their engineering and DPW departments, uh, what has been the experience there in those communities? Any other requests from our counselors? No? So I want to thank our town staff for taking the time to come out today and speak with us. Um, we will let you know the next time this is on the agenda um, and through, through Dave Zomack, our, our liaison here, um, so that we can figure out what our CRC recommendation will be back to the town council. So thank you. Yeah, yes. At this time, we are going to take a pause in our meeting. Um, and so we will be back probably in 10 to 15 minutes from our break. I'm going to pause the video too. Good morning. Uh, this is actually in the middle of a meeting of one of the council's subcommittees or committees called the Community Resource Committee. And in addition to the five people who are here for that committee, we have a couple other counselors who have joined us as well. So what we'd like to do is have you go ahead, come up here, 
and introduce our guests and the rest of the people that are with you today and have us say a few words, okay? Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Sandot Sering. Um, I'm the president of the Regional Sabani Association. I um, want to thank uh, you all for having us here. Um, with me is Representative Mr. Nurup Tsering, who's the representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama for North America and the Central Tibetan Administration. Uh, he's here on a visit uh, uh, due to the fact that we have a world premiere film screening uh, this evening at uh, UMass. It's at 7.30, it's free and open to the public, so we hope some of you will be able to join us. And the other reason why um, Representative Murab Tsering is here is um, to reach out to our elected officials. So this morning, we'll be visiting Senator Markey's office, um, as well as Senator Warren's, um, Congressman Richard Neal's office, uh, as well as Jim's office. Um, essentially to one, we want to thank uh, Congressman Jim McGovern and uh, President, uh, Senator Markey for co-sponsoring the Tibet Policy and Support Act of 2019. And one of the key highlight of this bill is uh, it really ensures that the institution of the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan Buddhist tradition of uh, the uh, reincarnation is protected, is preserved, uh, so that the Chinese cannot sabotage this because they're claiming that they have the right and they're gonna, gonna pick the next Dalai Lama, uh, the 15th Dalai Lama, which is ac absolutely not acceptable. So we wanna thank Jim for introducing this bill in the House. It's, uh, the bill is referred to as HR 4331. And then in the Senate, uh, um, Senator Marco Rubio had actually sponsored uh, the bill, uh, but. Uh, Senator Markey has also co-sponsored this. And so we're gonna request from Western Massachusetts, Congressman Richard Neal to also co-sponsor this, uh, and as well as Senator Warren's office. And really the key and the very fundamental principle of this bill is it's about human rights, it's about protection of religious freedom. Um, so I'm gonna have Representative Ngodup to say a few words. Uh, thank you uh, to all the council members. Thank you, uh, Madam, for you know meeting us at the gate. Uh, it wasn't expected. Uh, kind of overwhelmed uh, with the uh, uh, reception and uh, honor that you have given us. Uh, and uh, uh, it's so uh, so good to be here. Uh, I came yesterday, and as uh, Tundubla was explaining, I'm actually based in Washington D.C as the representative of His Holiness Dalai Lama and the Tibetan administration. So my main job is to uh, reach out to the members of the Congress and the State Department and uh, in my, my jurisdiction, Canada also falls in. So uh, we're only five members there, five star members, including myself. I will try to reach out to uh, all the members of the Congress as much as me possible. And then as mentioned by Tundullah, uh, we also have a Tibetan, uh, growing Tibetan community in uh, North America. So uh, at the moment, we have more than 30,000, uh, and they all are organized in uh, different Tibetan associations. Uh, so we have 31 Tibetan associations, and Amherst is uh, one of them, and uh, uh, we are so happy to see it, just as the, you know, Massachusetts and Amherst itself, uh, very uh, supportive and uh, active uh, for Tibetan cause. We also have a Tibetan association very uh, active, uh, although it's a small community here. But UMass uh, has been quite popular with the Tibetan world because of uh, the institution that has produced so many Tibetan students who have come here under the Tibetan scholarship program and uh, they came back to Dharamsala, India. Oh, it's maybe mine. <laughs> it's mine, sorry. <laughs> no, it's not mine. <laughs> mine. No. no, it's not mine. <laughs> uh, 
uh, but there was a call also to me, but I silenced that, so. <laughs> you did a better job of me than I did. <laughs> so yeah, uh, well, uh, mm, yeah, we have, uh, you know, uh, so, so UMass is very uh, uh, kind of popular with the Tibetan people, and uh, it has mm. given, you know, education and made uh, people, Tibetan people, capable of serving other Tibetan communities uh, in India, Nepal, so far with the, you know, all the new learnings they got from here. And uh, they've been serving the Tibetan communities in diaspora quite good. So, and then at the same time, we also try to liaison with the Chinese uh, overseas uh, students as well as, pro, you know, uh, staff members and also the business community try to make it uh, aware of uh, the Lama's stand in terms of solving the you know uh, the problem between China and Tibet through the Middle Way approach, and uh, also the CTA Central Tibetan Administration's uh, uh, effort in, uh, in trying to reach out to the Chinese government for negotiation, but. You know, unfortunately, not much is happening. So we try to put pressure and uh, uh, sub get support from the United States Congress. And uh, uh, you know, Massachusetts has been really very uh, vocal and supportive for Tibetan cause. And particularly, Congressman Jim McGovern has been really on the forefront of helping the Tibetan cause uh, in every step of the way. So overall, uh, it's just a, you know so much a pleasure, so much an honor to be here to see all of you. And as I was talking to one of uh, you, and uh, you were about even getting emotional, talk about Dalai Lama. So yes, uh, it's so moving, touching, uh, and uh, whenever I get them, I'll try even uh, tell to his holiness how the people are responding, try, you know, uh, trying to get that, that uh, try to get touch uh, emotionally and mentally uh, with Dalai Lama. So he, he is keeping very well. And just recently, we had a very special general meeting in Dharamsala where uh, Tibetans from across the world, they get together to talk about the reincarnation thing because China now is working hard uh, by in different ways to say that, okay, reincarnation is China's business. Dalai Lama's reincarnation is something that then they have to do, you know. They have a copyright to do it. Whereas we're saying that it is a Tibetan invention, it's a Tibetan rights, uh, Buddhist rights uh, to uh, select, elect, uh, choose the next Dalai Lama. And then on, on top of that, according to the Buddhist tradition, it is Dalai Lama himself who has the sole sort of right to reincarnate where and when. So the, the Tibetan people gather together in Dramsala from everywhere else to say, please do come back. And uh, during that time, he said he's, uh, you know, he's recovering, he's getting healthier, and uh, he's even thinking about visiting uh, Europe and the uh, United States. So we're also praying that he will be able to visit us soon. So with this word, thank you so much for all the council members. They've been saying that uh, you, you've been really helpful, supportive in you know, different occasions. Mm -hmm. So they were able to put up the Tibetan flag, uh, the Tibet Uprising Day, and uh, help them in wherever they come to you. So thank you very much for all that. We really enjoy having you here. And I must say the relationship between the town and the community of Tibetans in this area is very strong. Uh, I personally have been at three events. Uh, th the first one was when uh, Jim McGovern was here and you honored him and we were over at the university. The second one was many of us were there on a snowy March day uh, when you then all walked on to Northampton and we read the proclamation for you before you left. And then I was just totally honored to be at the birthday celebration of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And that was just so special. I tried dancing. It was... <laughs> I, it was it, well, I don't know that I did such a great job. <laughs> I'm going to have to practice. 
But I also would like uh, Shalini Balmain, who is one of our counselors and also has a strong relationship to your community, to speak. Our So I had the uh, recent opportunity to visit Dharamshala and I was, I've been sharing with the town councilors that there is this real uh, energy of peace and compassion in the whole of the town. And I have no doubt that His Holiness Dalai Lama's message of compassion and kindness is not just um, spoken, but it's really practiced and lived. And in the middle of the city of Dharamshala, there's this big sign that says our ethics is compassion and kindness. And that's what's needed for a smart city. And so I was really moved by that. And I would love for all of us to um, embody and you know, um, find ways that we can practice that. And, and you being so close to them, if you have any message of as counselors, as local official, elected officials, what, how can we um, bring that culture and uh, message of compassion and kindness? If there's anything you have to share, I would. I think it would benefit us all. Thank you. Thank well, you. Uh, first of all, thank you for visiting Dharamsala. Actually, this is you know one way of uh, strengthening or even getting to know what uh, Dalai Lama is uh, talking about or what Tibetan people are, how the Tibetan people are, you know, living, thriving, or struggling. So uh, we always encourage, uh, you know, members of the council members as well as uh, representatives at the state level or in the Congress level to visit Dharamsala. So uh, normally we also get a delegation from Washington and Seattle uh, uh, at the state level. So if there are some opportunities in the future uh, that uh, council members delegation to Dharamsala is something you know you would like to think about. We'll be very happy to host, and we'll be happy to arrange uh, through our you know the Tibetan Association here. And then uh, about the uh, the compassion thing. Now this is becoming so popular. His Holiness says that His Holiness Dalai Lama has, in uh, you know, in collaboration with the Emory University, who will put uh, His Holiness. Uh, message of peace, compassion, kindness into the curriculum form. And now it's called the sea learning, which is uh, secular, ethical, uh, social, emotional, ethical learning. And uh, last year, there was an international launch by His Holiness in Delhi. And now in South America, some of the countries, they have already, uh, you know, uh, worked on, introduced this in their schools. So it's actually uh, more like a social emotional learning kind of thing, but then an, an additional on the, onto it. And uh, I think maybe there's something we can explore with the Amherst uh, in, in the schools or even in the colleges, uh, because this is something you talk about, you know, the compassion, kindness, uh, not based on any religious denomination, it's on our common experiences as a human being. So it's a very, uh, very effective and uh, uh, based on the ra rational thing. So uh, we'll be able to send you, I'll, I'll send you information about that uh, if there are some interest. And uh, there's something definitely we can you know, uh, look into it, which it will be helpful not uh, not only to the school children or even college school or even the general public. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We also certainly hope that if you are able to arrange for His Holiness the Dalai Lama to come to this country, that you will strongly consider an event here in Amherst. We would love to have that, and I know that many, many people would join in that celebration. So we're going to give you a little token from our town, and then we're going to let the committee go on with their meeting. Okay? Thank you. Thank Thank you. you.
Yes, that's cool. The Pelton, uh -huh. you can wear it right up there with yes, that. Yes, yes, okay. thank you. Yeah, and I have one for the Easter. Thank you. As you say, all in one. So our town manager was not able to be here, but the Zomac our assistant town manager is. Thank you.
So it is now 10.01, and that was a little longer of a break than we expected, but for purposes of video, I think we're going to have to let people know the middle half an hour was not technically the CRC meeting. We are coming back into session um, after we had a lovely ceremony with uh, the representative of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Um, so we are back in a CRC meeting, back on video. And our next item is the draft affordable housing priorities policy, um, the report and recommendation to the um, town council. So a draft with revisions talked about last week was posted onto the packet. Um, does anyone have any recommended or requested changes to that draft? Dorothy. Um, I think perhaps maybe we might want to um, prioritize some things. And um, I often wake up recently with town council policy in my brain. And this morning I was thinking of uh, one of the things you've asked for in here is, is we need to know what we've done in the past, and I think it was Kathy yesterday said, we need to know how much money the town has spent, including foregone taxes. And trying to count while I'm half asleep units, we have how many units in the last couple of years the town have been created? The town hasn't created them. Some are, will be created by the town, but some are being created in some way of affordable housing, and I came to about, once we get to East Street School, maybe 50. And how many units of affordable housing did we not have because we didn't have our zoning law in place? And I came to another 50, at least, with the building that has just happened in the last number of years and some of the projects which are in process right now and in hearings and planning board. So you could say in the last few years, that's 100 possible units 50 of which we didn't have. So I'm thinking, and, and this seemed to be some of the thinking that was showing up in discussions and in this draft, that instead of at this time when we're trying to build the four capital projects, instead of thinking of taking more town money or CPA money for a major affordable housing, that what we need to do is to have it come as part of buildings that are brought in from developers, that all of them include some affordable housing, and that way, very quickly, we will have the 250 units or thereabouts that are in the proposed document. Pat. Um, I, I do agree that we need to look at zoning and we need to require of developers um, the inclusion of affordable housing. I do not believe that will fully address the problem. Um, I believe that the town needs to come to some real clear decisions and about how we are going to address homelessness, how we are going to address um, real affordability from people making below the area median income to people who are making the median or above but who are struggling for whatever reason. And um, so I, I I just want to make sure that the idea of developers taking over uh, and doing this, if we can even drive them there, is the real solution. Andy. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes to try and uh, say something about what uh, the discussion that Dorothy was referring to yesterday that occurred in the Finance Committee and my observations um, of uh, is a member of both committees, as is Dorothy, about the two discussions and where they differed little, actually. And um, it really gets into the question how we 
merge the discussion, which was something we were holding off on until there was the initial discussion at the Finance Committee meeting. Uh, the Finance Committee discussion was, um, as you might expect, a little bit more towards the financial elements of what we've done and how much it's cost to do this, what we've accomplished so far, and what it would cost to meet the needs, and then merging that going forward into the consequences if we were to um, try and go significantly further with town investment to address some of the problem that's here. Uh, what you come out of it all with is that it's a complicated issue. And I will give um, a couple of examples. Um, one is we received a report that really uh, can go to this committee very quickly because it's a published report. It was done a couple of years ago by Mr. Malloy in the planning department where uh, he um, summarized all of the work, the, all of the efforts that have been successful in building housing and tried to um, uh, determine how many affordable units was in each project and what the cost was for each affordable unit. Um, and it's in the Finance Committee packet so that it can be easily shared with this committee without any um, significant effort to uh, make it available. Um, the discussion that we had yesterday also included um, both the uh, uh, chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee and uh, the staff person in the finance department who supports that committee's work because we recognize that uh, Community Preservation Act funding is a significant portion of the resources that might be available. And uh, there were a couple of things that came out of it in the discussion that I would cite to immediately, and that is that the Community Preservation Act Committee can't create anything. It reacts to things. It receives um, the uh, proposals that might come forward and the housing things that have come have come from the various supporters of those organizations like um, the 132 Northampton Road um, came because it was a request from the organization that uh, was uh, putting that together and uh, it reached the Community Preservation Act Committee and then on their recommendation reached the council because of the um, Hilltown CDC's uh, work. So the, the creation doesn't come. The second thing is that we have a finite amount of uh, Community Preservation Act funds available, and we have a lot of other needs. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a requirement for uh, community, uh, or for housing, for historic preservation, and for um, open space. Recreation is a fourth category is permissible, but it's not um, a mandated percentage. The first three categories I've mentioned, there's a requirement that 10% of the available funds go to grants in those areas. Uh, we are aware of significant needs, and the Community Preservation Act is aware of significant needs regarding recreation. and. Um, We've heard um, a lot from our community about recreation needs, both improvements within recreation areas and uh, just fields uh, that are unsafe, either inadequate or unsafe. And uh, I think that our uh, staff, and Mr. Zomack could speak to this, is developing proposals that will be coming to CPAC and to our attention. 
We also know uh, when we get out of that particular area into what other funds might be available, that there are a lot of um, coming requests that we will need to be thinking about very carefully. Um, ECAC is going to be issuing a report to the uh, council soon, and I don't know, uh, because I haven't seen the draft report, it's not an area, it's an area I've been paying attention to, but I'm not attending their meetings, that there may be financial requests that come with it. Um, so there's a lot of competing demands, and ultimately the council is going to have to um, work with uh, the finance committee to try and understand what are all of the competing demands and to establish priorities. So uh, the conclusion of all of this from what I can say right now in this report is that Vice Chair <coughs> Kathy Shane and I, as chair, as chair of the Finance Committee, are going to um, work together to summarize uh, the Finance Committee discussion yesterday that um, is going to end up being a uh, document that's going to be somewhat similar to the uh, CRC uh, report draft that we have, and then we're going to have to make a decision between the two committees as to whether it makes sense to merge those documents because there are overlapping elements to them or to treat them as two separate documents uh, because ultimately what we are needing to do is get back to the council. So uh, I can a try and answer questions about yesterday's meeting, but I think that I have summarized it as best I can. I, Dorothy was also there and can add to it to the extent that she feels appropriate. Thank you. Any questions, comments on? Yes, Dorothy. I, I think what Pat brought up as are, are valid points, and I don't say that the having developers do it will set, take care of all of the need. Um, there is, of course, one project under uh, right now, the East Street School. We're waiting to see how that will develop which I hope will include some apartments for people at the low end, which is something that has been really brought to our attention recently, that people on disability, that that level of income is not really counted into our affordable, um, where nobody's providing those apartments. There's also discussion, and Dave can perhaps tell us more about this, of a piece of town land on Strong Street, and there's possible when we finish, conclude Hickory Ridge, that we will have a piece of land um, on Pomeroy Road. And one way for affordable housing to be more affordable is if the town can give the land and perhaps that would reduce some of the unit costs. So I, I do think we need to be working at all levels of affordability, but what, what has been at the bottom is has not been dealt with. And the, the people that are, um, and I think you did, this in our uh, the, the, this report, people at the higher end of the AMI um, who work in town at the universities are having a very hard time with housing. I did like the um, emphasis that there has to be something about home ownership um, in this report, um, and I also that we need to have family housing. I think there are just many aspects of this housing situation that we have to deal with, but. Um, we have to deal with it within the financial constraints of, if you read this morning's paper, we all, or as, at least most of us, committed to major capital projects. Somehow we're going to have to do this. Mr. Zemeck. Um, sure, just a couple of comments. I was not able to make the CPA, or excuse me, the Finance Committee meeting yesterday where the CPA C was uh, discussed broadly and, and, and affordable housing more specifically. Um, Andy, I pre presume what you're referring to is the housing production plan? Is that the document that you were referring to? Actually, um, 
glad you mentioned that. No, the housing production plan it was mentioned yesterday, and we mm -hmm. did talk about that because it is a document that is referred to in the uh, policy that the, AA, the, the, the Affordable Housing Trust has forwarded to the council that we're working on, and there's the reference in there, and the 250 goal in five or 10 years actually came out of that report. Um, I um, can show you the document that uh, Mr. Malloy's summary, um, that's a different document. Okay, I think I have a hard copy now. I appreciate that. So I think going back to one of your earlier um, comments, I think uh, you said, Andy, it's complex. So this is a very complex subject. Um, Steve was on the planning board for a number of years. Um, I think I think we all recognize that it is a, a serious and real issue in town and we need to um, use all avenues to try to uh, address the situation and create more affordable units at all levels of affordability. Um, so I think, I think there's general agreement um, that we do that. I will say that I think the town has done um, quite a good job at trying to keep up with the, the demand, but market forces are something that we often can't control. So I wanna be a little cautious that we, we, we recognize that we need to use all available tools in our tool belt, because just to say that um, the, that developers are going to, that somehow we're going to force or make developers include uh, affordable units is not, I don't think, gonna get us where we wanna be. We've used creative means, uh, as Dorothy just referenced. Um, we have um, East Street School is a great example where the town, through the select board uh, and town meeting, took action to say, we will essentially donate that land to an affordable housing project. Years before that, we did Olympia Oaks up in North Amherst off of Olympia Drive. Um, 40 to 50 units there of town land. And then more recently, we creatively worked with, um, with Beacon on two projects. One is um, at Rolling Green and then using CPA funds. And then more recently up in the North Square for 26 units, um, which is probably on this list with a tax increment financing plan there, um, which was on the neighborhood of about $2.7 million of tax relief over a 10 year period. So what I'm trying to do is illustrate there are many tools in our tool belt. We need to use them all. I think um, Mandy and Lynn and, and, and I and, and the town manager have been talking about approaches to zoning and that's definitely a tool in our tool belt. So I think, I think a lot of us are ready to roll up our sleeves. Staff is ready to do that. Uh, I've had many conversations with Rob Mora, our building commissioner and Christine Brestrup um, and I think I, I think we're all enthusiastic, looking forward to the next months and next couple of years to uh, figure out how do we create, how do we work together to create more units using all the tools in our tool belt, so. Thank you, Andy. I'm glad you mentioned uh, North Square and um, sort of gets back to a couple of th different pieces here because it was mentioned made of Pomeroy Lane and Hick the Hickory Ridge property too. Everything has a cost. None of these things are free. And ultimately the town's resources are limited. When we made the decision, which was ultimately a select board vote, to give the tax to enter into the tax increment financing piece in order to um, assure um, an in perpetuity commitment to some affordable housing units, including some deep afford, um, sort of very low AMI um, units, um, we recognize that we're giving up tax for a period of time and um, so that that's revenue to the town. It's a direct financial consequence as much as an expenditure on the expense side is a real cost. And 
obviously that's where the finance committee discussion comes in though we did end up obviously talking about sort of policy choices too because that's where it all comes together and ultimately is a council decision um, as far as Pomeroy Lane is concerned I'll, I can give you the you, you've uh, uh, you, you've uh, given a uh, very good reason to say that we should give that land that is uh, part of Hickory Ridge that's along the main roadway uh, for, for affordable housing. But then the consequence is that um, there's a member of the Finance Committee who's been saying all along that um, she, she's not comfortable with the idea that we are uh, using that much of our uh, stabilization fund to purchase property, but that it's valid to do because that land is available to be sold and the ability to recoup some of that investment that we're making in purchasing the property by being able to sell the land um, reduces the amount that is the pressure on the stabilization fund. As we go forward with four major projects, the stabilization fund was built over the years in part by a deliberate effort to make funds available to make it possible to address the four major projects in whatever process that we come up with, whatever the results of that process are. Um, and uh, we also know that um, at some point, this great economy is going to hit a skid, and we're going to have um, a uh, period where we're going to have a recession that we're going to have to deal with. And those of us who uh, managed the, pr the budget process through the last recession know how much the stabilization fund is important in order to keep the town moving forward and not harm what we are providing to our community and our community expects to us through the stabilization fund. These are all complicated issues and are going to not be uh, easy for the council. So I, I'm going to take myself back to the memo itself that's drafted because I had some recommended changes um, that I want to mention before I add them into it to see if people are okay with it. Um, under the general comments, um, the general feedback number 10 that discusses specific zoning strategies um, in the zoning bylaw um, or specific implementation strategies, I would like to add into that not just the inclusionary zoning minimum percentage but also the potential for removing single family dwelling zoning from town. Um, so that's one of the changes I would like to add. The other one is in 11, just under that, um, where we reference a specific home sharing program. I would be more comfortable making that a general reference instead of to a specific program. So I, I would remove, and so that that one would read local development of home sharing programs that match homeowners. So describing the program instead of a specific corporate program itself. Yeah. Dorothy. I have a follow-up on this. Um, this is something that they, in the same number 11 is a topic that's been discussed, and I f swear that I keep hearing different things. And that is the um, tax incentives, what is it? Encouraging two-family homes with owner occupancy through tax incentives. That sounds to me like a good idea, and yet didn't we bring that up with the tax assessor, and didn't he say that that wasn't possible? Um, it is. Uh, Steve. So just to the point of the um, single family zoning, so affordable duplexes, which is obviously two family zoning, is allowed by right in many of the zones of Amherst. So maybe an amendment to that would be to, make, you know, um, look at the remaining zones and see why those are you know, exempted. 
put, just, just adding it into the document as if these things are possible and would be recommended for increasing affordable housing. Yeah. That, that's. So they, they're allowed yeah. somewhere, but not other places. That is, oh, that okay. is true. Yes. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I've seen your hand, Miss <laughs> McGowan. Um, but, but, um, but please be patient. Um, uh, any other recommended changes to this document right now? I'm not seeing any, so that means while I do not have public comment on the agenda for this specific item, and we already finished general public comment for the day, um, there is a member of our planning board in the audience who is, who would like to make a comment right now. Um, so I am going to open it back up to public comment for, for that to be made. Thank you, I actually have to leave, and so I'm not, um, I'm gonna do this as a quasi-public comment because I'm on the um, zoning subcommittee. So in terms of, the documents we are, that are going to be circulating and the new ones, I'm preparing a list of the recommendations um, made by the under the Amherst Housing Study and the um, Housing Production Plan. So I'm just I'm just typing out a big list for the Zoning Subcommittee and Planning Board. I'd be really happy to pass that along. Um, both of those reports um, re um, recommended a 15% inclusionary zoning requirement across across the board, not any um, particular exemptions for um, projects over a certain amount. Also, I think it's the Amherst Housing Study that recommends um, building housing that excludes students because it opens up apartment housing um, and condos and things um, at the lower end or the middle end um, for families and people. And so that's legally allowed. And so that could be a requirement for some types of projects saying, you know, this is, you know, this is apartment housing for families and you know, non-students. So as long as you're not discriminating on age, it's okay. Um, I've, in my short time on the planning board, um, we've had two projects permitted, um, and none of them had of affordable units in it. We had like 60 plus units um, of apartment housing. And then meanwhile, on University Drive, we were doing some kind of follow-up permit, and there's affordable housing in that um, a project that's not, I don't know if it's 25 units, doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me why some are required or not required. Um, and so I was just gonna say, the other question and point is, what do other places do? Somerville is at a 25% affordability requirement. Cambridge is at, at 20%. I'm sure if we looked around at other communities like us, we would see that this is very, the inclusionary zoning requirement is very broad and it's commonly used. And there's usually like an alternative, like if you can't, fit it in, you have to you know, put money into a fund so units can be built. So that's my pitch. Um, so the zoning subcommittee is looking at the question of you know, two family houses, infill development, like small scale, like how people can add units onto their houses or a supplemental unit um, and things like that. So we're all moving in the same direction, but I wanna just make sure that my, you, know, we're, you see what we're all looking at too. So thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> We're nearing the end of our meeting time. Um, so I had posted on the agenda that we might be able to get to a vote today. I don't think that is going to happen. Um, so I'm gonna put it, um, and without a council meeting next Monday, which is when I thought it might come up for a discussion, we're, we're not under any time crunch to try and force something today for that. So I'm going to leave our discussion where it is today um, think about what, maybe talk with the chair of the finance committee about whether it might be possible to merge memos and potentially then have each committee vote on a single memo instead of two separate memos. Um, so, so I will talk to the chair. I know he is on this committee too, so there's, but I think because it's a strategy, it, it is a um, sort of administrative thing um, that, that it will be allowed as we figure out what we might present to each of our committees for a vote. Um, and we'll put it back on for our November 6th meeting that is coming up. Um, with that, we have one minute. I would love to get to adopting minutes because there are three sets of minutes that are outstanding right now. Um, so we're going to try and do that before GOL starts very soon. Um, and so the minutes we have are August 21, September 25, and October 16. Um, they are in SharePoint. Um, I 
Is, uh, does anyone have any requested changes to the August 21st minutes? No. So we'll move on to October 16. Um, no, nope, sorry. Sept <laughs> I skipped a month. The September 25 minutes. Um, I had two changes, two requested changes to those. I think I posted them in SharePoint, though, um, that said as amended. Um, and those changes were who made the motion to nominate myself as chair. Um, and it was technically Councillor Schreiber. So, so that was one of the changes. And then there was a misspelled word. Um, so I was correcting the misspelled word were my two recommended changes, um, proposed changes for that. Do anyone, does anyone else have changes, re requested changes to the September 25 minutes? And to the October 16 minutes, um, let me find my copy of those. I had myself, I did not post these, I have two changes. One was to put my full name into the list. So instead of Mandy Haneke, Mandy Joe Haneke, that was my own fault. I did not tell the minute taker that. Um, and the other one was in number three. It's the second to last paragraph that starts. Steinberg noted that the finance committee will be reviewing the policy and it said next year. Um, that should be next month, I think. Not Maybe next week, but I thought it was at least next month because you guys already did it. But um, I, should it be month or week? Let's see, where was the it data? Said, the date was October 16, so, you, so, so week probably, yes. week, week. Um, I knew year was wrong, um, so we will go with week on that. Um, any other requested changes to the October 16 minutes? No, so seeing none, um, I will accept a motion to, let me get the right dates, to adopt the August 21st, 2019 CRC minutes as presented, the September 25th, 2019 CRC minutes as amended, and the October 16, 2019 minutes as amended. Do I hear that motion? Pat makes that motion as second? Second. Dorothy seconds it. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye and raise aye. your hand. That is unanimous. So those are all adopted. Uh, any announcements? We are, I will announce that we, with no time left, we are skipping discussion item 3A. Um, so that was discussion on traffic and transportation and public infrastructure. We will find another time, um, hopefully when we, I can work with Mr. Zomack to bring in our de Department of Public Works superintendent too, to have a, and potentially with a joint meeting with TAC. So we'll see when I can get that back on an agenda, but I wanted to put on the video that we are officially skipping it. Um, Dorothy seemed to have an announcement of some sort yeah, no. or a announcement. I, I'm just thinking of all the things that we've discussed today, and I believe it's several times that you have made official requests for more information, and um, it's just, I think that's a lot for you to follow up on, and uh, if you are, I thank you. Oh, thank you. Anything else? With that, I'm going to declare us adjourned at 10.33 a.m. Thank you.